So let me start by saying we didn't even raise the sails or bring our Hobie Cat 16 to the water unless there was enough wind to be able to fly a hull. I totally get the exhilaration of, you know, sailing a fast boat, especially a fast catamaran. Uh, there's nothing quite like getting air off the wake of a fishing trawler on a Hobie 16 in a, in a stiff wind. Uh, love going fast. What we're here to talk about today is not wants. Uh, what we're here to talk about is needs, which is a little bit different. So uh, the question, does a cruiser or an extended passage maker need a fast catamaran when we're comparing catamarans to each other? Uh, of course, the answer is going to be different for everybody. But there are some factors that, that we should talk about and discuss. Um, so, you know, we, when we look at various uh, marketing ploys like polar diagrams, uh, there's countless pundits out there who will tell you that they're garbage. Uh, most of them are computer-generated uh, marketing pieces. Um, that said, fast catamarans are fast. Uh, there's no question that a, uh, a certainly a gunboats and things of, of that bespoke nature are, are fast. Um, but even the Outremer, uh, and, and the data that we're going to show you is going to re-illustrate, they are definitely fast. They are faster. Uh, the question is how much faster, and is it worth it, and is it worth what you give up to, to get one? Uh, so here's the question. An extended cruiser uh, or an extended uh, liveaboard, what are they doing, and, and why would they want a fast catamaran? Um, I think the, the biggest issue... Uh, for most of these folks, is going to be long passages. Uh, these are going to be the big ocean crossings, uh, where you're going to be weeks at a time at, at sea, or even a week. Uh, these are where having a fast catamaran seems like it's going to make uh, the biggest difference. So you're going to be able to slice days off your trip. Um, so where do we get information to actually quantify this? Because there's a lot of different catamarans claiming different performance levels, uh, you know, not a text versus uh, lagoons and fountain pajots, uh, etc. Well, there's not a lot of great information out there, um, and you know most of the boat reviews on the market are qualitative. They're they're you know this one feels good, this one looks good, uh, and that's about it. So there is a data source out there, uh, and I've done some number crunching as I su suggested we would do uh, in some of our past uh, episodes about the ARC. The ARC is kind enough to document uh, boat performance, and they've got archives of past performance uh, for all of the, the boats that have made the crossings for the past you know, 10 to 15 years. Uh, I didn't crunch that many years. I think I did four years. I think I did 16 through the current 2019 season, and specifically for this discussion, I just focused on the catamarans. Um, so when we look at these crossings, uh, this is kind of the ideal situation. This is a long Atlantic crossing. Um, and it really benefits uh, catamarans because it's it's following the trades winds. It's for the most part downwind sailing. Uh, you're, you're following the or, or carried with the trades wind trade winds from the Canaries to uh, to the Caribbean. Um, so when we we look into the numbers, um, you know I've I've resorted the data a little bit because the ARC uh, lays things out in their results with a. A handicap much like the golfers use. So um, there's an algorithm used, it's a fairly widely used algorithm for sailing sports uh, to level the playing field between different types of boats because not everybody can afford the same kinds of boats and sizes of boats. Uh, so I've stripped some of that out. Uh, they did publish the raw times. So I'm just looking at the raw times going across because I do want to see what the difference is in between the boats and which ones do come out in front. Because when you look at the, the ARC results, it's always the lagoons that come out on top, or for the most part. Uh, but there's clearly the boats that cross the Atlantic much quicker than the lagoons, uh, lagoons uh, have. Uh, and by looking at the raw results, we can see that rather than the, uh, the handicapped results. So, you know, first, if we look at um, each of the different years uh, to get more volume of data, because if you just take a small sample, you don't get a really good... Uh, idea of what's truly going on. You need more and more data to get true patterns. Uh, so that's what I did. I took each of the four years uh, and then I took all of the combined data and made some judgments based on that. So first, if we if we take one year, uh, we look at the number of boats that come across um, 
it's on the order of, you know, 20 to 30 boats. Uh, they're pretty wide uh, array of sizes and types of boats that come across. The you know smallest are generally in the 40 foot range and the largest are generally in the 60 to 80 foot range. Uh, very rare at the 80 foot in the catamarans. But uh, there's a pretty good dispersion of sizes and types. Um, I would have liked to see more of the sportier cruising uh, hulls like the Naughty Tech for more uh, consistent data or for more uh, meaningful data, but there just aren't as many of those in the in the numbers. There's lots of lagoons, um, and there's actually a fair number of outremers, which is kind of interesting too. But looking at the at the raw data, you know, I did 16, 17, 18, and 19, uh, and then I grouped them all together in the end to to show you what the total results were. So the first, uh, the single year, we've got great comparison between boats. They're all suffering the same weather as they go across, but if we want to compare that to the following year, it's a totally different weather pattern, and we can see that in the average speed of the boats that come across. Uh, so we need a way to compare performance year after year. So what I've done was taken the average crossing time for each of the four years, and I've compared the boats as a percentage of average. So if we see the, the fastest boats come across, it'll show they have like a 20 to 30% better than the average crossing. And then the slowest boats will be like a negative 10 to 20% uh, compared to the average crossing. And this gives us a, a way to compare the average percentages, so to speak, when we look at the, the final uh, sum of the four years. So the, the, uh, the overall across the four we're, we're not so much looking at the uh, absolute time coming across, we're looking at how they performed against the average for the year that they crossed. Uh, and this allows us to be able to compare uh, four years of data with different weather patterns to see an overall pattern in the boats. I'll quickly go over each year's data before jumping into the uh, overall results, but uh, for the time being, let's just take a quick look at the 2016 results. I've sorted these out by actual time crossing, and we can see there's a, a Nutramare 5X, a Katana 531, and a Lagoon 620 way out in front, starting at 15, 22, and 28 percent better than the average time, uh, followed up by a Lagoon 52, not too, too much farther behind, but then it actually drops down pretty close to average fairly quickly with uh, a Katana 47, a bunch of leopards, and a Fountain Peugeot. So here I've graphed the actual time of crossing the Atlantic versus the length of boats on a, a XY plot. And we can see there's a, a pretty clear trend towards longer boats making the passage in shorter time, uh, time being at the bottom scale and length being on the vertical scale. In order to compare passages from different years that have different weather, I needed a way to normalize the data. So in order to do that, what I've chosen to do is to uh, measure the boats versus the average crossing of that year. So this graph shows for 2016 uh, what the percentage of uh, average time each of the boat had uh, as a function of its length. Uh, so on the bottom, we have a percent versus uh, average time. Uh, a negative percentage means it was slower than average, and a positive percentage means it was faster than average. Uh, on the left-hand or vertical scale, we can see the length of the boats uh, for each data point. Again, we see this clear trend towards uh, longer boats making faster passages. Moving on to the 2017 results, you can see here I've actually disqualified uh, the TS-42 uh, Marcedon, I believe, uh, for being just too bespoke, uh, unlikely to be something that most people are ever going to approach. Uh, I've left the number there just so that you can see uh, 319 hours versus 349. It did make uh, you know nearly uh, a day shorter passage than the next best, the Utremer 64 light. Uh, but I, as again, uh, I've disqualified this type of boat in all these calculations, and there's a couple others that you'll see in the other years. For the 2017 time versus length graph, again, we see the same pattern, longer boats making faster passages, uh, with perhaps the grouping be a bit tighter on this one than in the previous year, 2016. Normalized data for 2017, no surprise, still following the same trend in time and boat length. In the 2018 year results, uh, you can see I've disqualified another two boats. These are an Icane and a Cygnus uh, Ocean Explorer 60. Uh, but as you can see here, they were actually both bested by an Outremer 5X in this particular year's crossing, uh, but only slightly. Um, so 
trying to be fair, but I'm trying to also make this you know uh, analysis reasonable for uh, the bulk of the masses out there who might be trying to stretch for a an Ultramare versus going with a less expensive something like a Lagoon. 2018, time versus length, showing a nice tight grouping around the trend line, uh, with the few high flyers being at the at the high end, one of those being the Ultramare. 2018 normalized data, a percent better than average calculations. Again, nice tight grouping for 2018. And the 2019 results, uh, that would be this past year's uh, ARC, uh, I've eliminated five boats. There were several Marcedons, a Swiss Cat, a Granger, um, and these, again, are outside what I'm considering a, a normal catamaran, uh, showing our top contestant being an Uchmer 5X, and followed up by a Lagoon. Uh, pretty interesting. But there is a big difference between that Lagoon and that Uchmer this year. 2019 time versus length graph, again showing a nice tight grouping with just a couple of high flyers in the middle there. And 2019 normalized results, again, similar trend, not a surprise at this point. So what I've done here is compiled the complete results from all four years and sorted them in order of the percent versus average of the year in which they performed. And that would be this uh, second to last column here. So we can see that the uh, Ultramare uh, 64 light that ran in 2017 uh, comes out at the top at about 31.7% faster than average. Uh, followed, uh, not surprisingly, by a bunch of other Ultramares at uh, 28 to 30 percent. Uh, the next best runner-up is the Katana 531 at 22.8 percent. Uh, we can see from the number of days, you know, it's on the order of one day difference at this point. The next best uh, non-sort of performance catamaran is going to be the Lagoon 560. Um, this comes in at 17.8. Uh, again, this is only two days difference, you know, three days versus five days. It's not a huge difference compared to the total uh, transit time across the Atlantic. So it begs the question, uh, is the loss of hull volume and comfort uh, carrying capacity worth it uh, with the Ultramares versus going something like this Lagoon 560? Uh, it's quite a bit bigger and it gets you there in almost the same amount of time. Um, you know, another next best is this Naughty Tech 47. Uh, I was expecting to see more of these up at the higher end. Uh, we did get one, uh, and as we touched on in the other uh, years, uh, you know, some of this is sorted, or not sorted, but uh, tinted by, you know, the, the actual sailors uh, running these boats. You know, it could be just that they weren't pushing the boats. We don't know. Uh, all we can look at is large numbers of data to get average, you know, results. Um, down at the bottom of the list, you know, what we can see pretty clearly, uh, as it shows in the graphs, is that the shorter boats tend to be down here. The 40s, the 38s, the 42s, uh, versus what we see at the top of the list. If we ignore the Ultramares at the top, uh, and we can see that we've got Katanas and Lagoons, etc., that are in generally in the 60-foot range, uh, this Naughty Tech is per perhaps a, uh, an anomaly may support their marketing that uh, the Nauta Tech is a, is a faster cruising catamaran. So when we look uh, it, at raw times coming across and we sort by time it took them to come across, we see two distinct patterns. Uh, number one is they are the ultra performance catamarans, specifically the Ultramares, uh, come out on top every time. They do cross the ocean quite a bit faster. Uh, the second piece of interesting data, though, is it's followed very closely by boat length, and which is not a surprising uh, factor to those of us who've been following sailboats for, for some time. Uh, longer boats tend to go faster than uh, shorter boats uh, because of uh, water dynamics with uh, the bow wave that's created on the boats. If you've got a, a longer boat, it can absorb a, a longer, deeper bow wave. Uh, a shorter boat, when it creates a bow wave, it tends to get into a, a situation where it's climbing up the bow wave rather quickly. So longer boats don't suffer this as badly. Catamarans, uh, because they tend to have a much longer and narrower hull profile, their math is a little bit different, but they still suffer the same problem. Uh, it's just the, the bow wave characteristic is different. Uh, so they can go a little bit faster for a boat length than a monohull can. But nonetheless, 
looking at the data, it's pretty clear that we look at the uh, slopes of the data. Um, there's a clear pattern showing that a longer boat is going to go faster by a significant amount. Uh, and it's almost more prevalent than the boat type. Uh, so it's hard, hard to separate out what the, the advantage is of the, the Outremer, you know, ultra lightweight daggerboard cat versus the rest. Um, but, you know, looking at the rest of the data, you know, if we just look at the percentage numbers of the, the nearest neighbors, uh, if we look at, say, you know, the next, next best catamaran, sometimes it's the, uh, I think there was a, a, a katana that was in there, which is still somewhat of a performance daggerboard cat, but a more, more heavy displacement model. Uh, but the lagoons do show up, and this is probably why even with the, uh, the uh, uh, handicapping that they get from ARC, uh, that they come out as number one, is because they're still pretty darn fast. It, it, so the, the question becomes, you know, if we see these uh, lagoons, you know, uh, uh, passing the, the same crossing only a day or two behind the Outremers, uh, is it worth the sacrifices that you're going to give up uh, to get that extra little bit of speed? So, you know, on a, on a Atlantic crossing, that's going to be two week time, two week passing. Some of these are average 16 to 19 days, uh, I believe. Is it worth one or two days to, to suffer uh, tight, tight living quarters, um, you know, and perhaps even uh, stress levels? You know, if you're ripping along sometimes at 18 to 20 knots, if you ever get that kind of wind on the trade winds to be able to let you do that, uh, that that's going to put a lot of stress on you. Whereas it's shown in the data that a lot of these boats and they're, this, the ARC is not a race. So a lot of these cruisers are just making a good, efficient crossing. Uh, so they're not out there constantly trimming, uh, but they set a good sail trim and they enjoy their crossing and they make it in nearly the same time as the ultra high performance catamarans. So this comes back to the question, do you really need the high speed a performance catamaran as a cruiser or extended passage maker, and I think I'm leaning towards the answer is no. I think you don't. I think you you uh, you don't even have to pay all that much attention to whether it's a, a performance cruiser or a luxury cruiser. Uh, there's clearly some uh, bollies, uh, a sun reef, other big uh, you know vacation type boats that made it across uh, very quickly compared to qu quite a few of the rest of the fleet. Um, Looking at the data, and specifically, you know, if we look at the overall data and the trend of boat sizes versus crossing, it's pretty clear that you're probably better off spending on length than you are on quote-unquote performance. Uh, so if you if you can, you know, buy a, a you know, 1.5 million dollar Outremer uh, that's only 40 feet long, you know, you could probably get a 60 foot in the same, you know, in a different brand like a Lagoon, etc. For similar money, that's going to give you two, three, four times as much space, um, more comfort. Uh, you know, it's it's not going to be as bouncy in the in the seas as the lighter weight uh, catamarans are going to be. Um, no, you're not going to have that exhilarating opportunity to to rip, you know, on a, on a good beam reach. But maybe you maybe you rent a Hobie cat on the weekends. <laughs> yeah, that's if if you're out there to cruise and see the world. Um, you know, comfort, uh, storage capacity. And that's the other thing. A, a lot of people will talk about, you know, the benefits that you get from a, a, a high-speed cat. Uh, much of it is dependent on the weight. If you can get the weight really low, you know, catamarans can go really fast. They're much more likely to, to get up closer to a plane uh, or plane completely or even fly a hull in some of the uh, more extreme situations. But in reality, uh, it's it's been shown that most people end up overloading the boats and, you know, putting all the necessary needs for living and extended cruising on the boat. And at that point, they're sometimes even over displacement and heavy. Um, so at that point, you might as well have just gotten a, a bigger boat, a longer boat, and had oodles of extra space and comfy cushions, uh, be able to walk around your bed at night and tuck yourself in, not have to crawl over from the backside. Um, so... Those are my two cents. Um, you know, real quick, uh, we'll look at a couple of the layouts and show you just what the size difference is comparing the some of the faster boats in these calculations, the Outremers, uh, to what you could get otherwise. And, and I think you'll find it pretty enlightening. 
So on the left here, we have the Outremere 5X outline, uh, and these are all roughly to scale just to show you what the different layouts look like and illustrate what I was talking about in terms of usable interior volume. Uh, so for comparison, let's put the Lagoon 560 up next to it. So the Lagoon 560 is just slightly shorter, uh, but it's you know, still that roughly you know, 60 foot catamaran kind of size. Uh, we can immediately see uh, how much more interior space there is uh, you know full walk around beds there's four of them versus the three in the Outremer. Uh, just generally a lot more interior volume uh, for the same length of boat uh, so yes it's going to be a little bit slower but so much more space inside uh, for comparison let's put the uh, Fontaine Pajot Elba 45 right up next to the Outremer. Uh, we can see here that it's roughly the same size interior space, but even still, the Fontaine Peugeot Elba 45 still has more, you know, usable space in there. You can fully walk around these beds just about uh, at least three quarters of the way. Uh, even the uh, forward berths have more usable space than what you see in the Outremer, where you have to crawl into every bed. Um, so now let's split the difference and take a look at the Katana 62, uh, which is actually slightly longer than both of these boats, but still roughly the same size category, but a compromise. You know, this is a daggerboard cat, so it's uh, more of a performance cat than the Lagoon is. Uh, you do get narrower hulls that you can see that in the, in the uh, images laid out here, which are, again, roughly to scale. Uh, but we can see that uh, you know, you've still got a mostly walk-around bed uh, in at least in the rear stateroom, uh, the two forwards are only half walk around, uh, but still better than the, the Outremer, which is not walk around at all. Uh, we get a lot more usable interior space, um, more bathrooms, uh, just a more generous layout in every respect here. Uh, and again, the price on this is much more attractive. This is uh, you know, probably three quarters of a million dollars cheaper than Outremer, although it's a fair amount more than the Lagoon is.